bald, <laughs> sincere, accumulator of relationships, enduring, efficient, quite the catalyst, humble, authentic, proactive, proactively visionary, unchanging, inspiring, frugal, luminous, indomitable, short, <laughs> that was me, calm, inde indefatigable, is that right? <laughs> stalwart, many people said he's a, uh, use that word stalwart, venerable, ebullient, sweet tooth, where's Elsa? <laughs> Dynamic, reassuring, principled, unobviously subversive. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, when Suki told me just a short time ago, she was collecting uh, one single word from many, many people. I was getting a little bit scared, but you guys showed uh, remarkable reticence, and I, and I thank you for that. I don't know if you people can have any idea of just how much this means to me to see all of you here today, uh, each with your own story, each with your own part of this organization. Um, this has just been a glorious day, and I truly hope it's been a good day for you, too. It's a... <clears throat> It's a good day to remind ourselves of what we're all really about when together we form this organization called VIA. And as you know, uh, anyone who gives a summer or a year or two or more uh, is part owner of uh, VIA. And we have our entire ownership here, at least a very, very good, good part of it. Before I go further, um, I know that we should all thank all of those who made it possible for us to be here today, because this program, this day, took a great, great deal of planning that went back for months and months and months. I'm not going to try and mention all the names because I would assuredly miss a name or two or five, but I can't go past this moment without mentioning Jean Blamey. Jean Blamey. <clears throat> Jean is the VIA board chair, and uh, although I still can't quite believe this, she once claimed that she loves planning events. <laughs> Everyone else that I have heard hates that job, but Jeannie somehow uh, loves it, and Jeannie, you have done a fantastic job. Thank you for bringing us all together in this way. <clears throat> A celebration of 50 years uh, brings back my thoughts to VIA's beginnings. And lest anyone labor under the illusion that uh, VIA started with a well-thought-out plan, <laughs> let me unburden you immediately, <laughs> yes. So much of this was really by chance. You think of that group of freshmen back in 1963 who would meet regularly and do a lot of talking about the kind of person they would like to become. And incredibly, for that time, would talk about the fact that their lifetime would largely be, or in part, determined by the non-Western world. And they realized that they, had little, uh, that they had little sense of that world. We talked of ways of getting into that world and began talking about volunteerism, idle talk, 
But then the next chance was that World University Service would contact us and tell us about the need for volunteers in Hong Kong the following summer. And then the chance later in 1977 that two of the leading universities of Japan, Keio and Waseda, would come to us and ask us to plan summer English language American culture programs at a time when that just wasn't done and the chance that gradually over time we would pick up or maybe have forced upon us the habits, the ways, the format that led VIA to be able to continue for these 50 years. I think it's important to realize that VIA did start in really unusual times. Villa was born in the early 60s, a very special moment for this nation. We had an inspirational president, John Kennedy, who had just begun the Peace Corps a couple of years earlier. We had the Civil Rights Movement. And on this campus, we saw so many of the students jump in cars, drive for 40 hours to Mississippi, work like everything for two weeks, come back and then work like everything to finish their work before the end of that term. And we read the Stanford Daily every day telling us who had been beaten, who had been jailed. We had the Vietnam War, which ended out of public discontent, much of it fomented by students. The climate was different from anything that we have had since and characterized by a sense that young people could really change this world, as indeed they did at that time. That passion trumps personal profit, and that a life well lived has a place for service. It was also a time when simple living had cachet, which certainly helped VIA a great deal because it kept us with staff uh, staff that could feel the support of the young people around them at that time. Well, this, is, this was the climate that made it easier to talk about a volunteer service and experience, for that to resonate in other people's lives. If, over the years, uh, VIA has found a formula, uh, perhaps that, too, was really due in large part to chance and circumstance. We were necessarily humble in our representations in Asia as to what we could do. We were sending 19, 20, 21 year olds who had been given precious little training by, well, by VIA. And we were small. But those realities forced upon us a style which we only probably later recognized as one that has served us very, very well. Going into Asia with a humble demeanor. By simply saying to prospective host institutions in Asia that um, the bargain we're looking for is this. Um, if you see that our labor is fair trade for the immense personal education that you can give us, then we have a deal. This wasn't Americans barging into Asia bearing gifts, but rather there was the reciprocity there. Uh, this was an Asian institution offering the gift of experiential education in return for our labor. And in that trade, as most of us know, we probably got the better part of that deal. And that idea of being small, <clears throat> this is um, heresy to say here in Silicon Valley, but in truth, VIA and the volunteer program is probably not scalable. And think about it for just a second. If, if you can imagine the possibility that VIA would have 500 volunteers each, each year, there would be no way that VIA could do that very personal job of matching person and post. We wouldn't have every volunteer going out each year knowing every other volunteer in his or her year. And I'm sure we wouldn't have people talking nearly as much about VIA family. And on this 50th year, I think we would have a little less to celebrate. So that small size has served us in many, many ways. Now, to be sure, VIA has been able to grow in other ways besides the volunteer program. Most notably, we have the Stanford program side of VIA, which 
by the way, is a lot larger than the volunteer program. Uh, that program will bring 250 young people from Asia to California in this year. There was the appropriate technology project and other projects that we've had over the years. I think that sometimes um, the most accurate sense, certainly the most human sense of an organization, can be gotten through stories. And let me tell you a couple of my favorite ones. Um, some of you may have heard one or two of these, so please be patient. Uh, <clears throat> the first comes out of the Philippines, and it is used to illustrate the point that uh, we may not know exactly why a host institution might ask us in. We simply have to take that on trust. We've had a number of volunteers in the Philippines for many years, most of them in Mindanao, the southern part of the Philippines, and many of those students at Mindanao State U, a university set up by the Philippine government to serve the Muslim minority in the southern part of that country. And our particular job there was to um, work, work with the freshmen uh, in remedial English and mathematics. Well, toward the end of our first year there, I dropped by mostly to see our volunteers, but also to talk to people there and find out if they wanted volunteers for a second year. And fortunately, I knew quite well the people I was talking with, so they could respond to me in a candid way. Actually, they responded in almost a brutally candid way because they came back and said, Dwight, you don't know your own program. <laughs> so I paused and let them explain, and they said, do you realize that to our students, your volunteers come from this country that, that has everything. It's rich, it's powerful, it dominates the media of this world. These people come in here with everything. And yet, these volunteers, when they come, they're so interested in Maranao culture and Maranao music and Maranao art and Maranao wedding ceremonies, everything. Do you have any idea how much pride this gives our Maranao young, young people. These people coming from the country that has everything find so much value in their own culture. That's why we want to have your volunteers here. Well, back here in California, we would never in a thousand years have gathered that this was the real reason for having volunteers there. But it was a good reason, and it taught us an important lesson. The second story, and the last story that I'm going to tell you, uh, comes from the Stanford program side. And it helped to teach me the power of bringing people together. And in this particular case, particularly bringing people together when they're all 5,000 miles away from home. Because that is the situation in which one can be even more free of regular cultural constraints and rules, but think just as openly and freely and internationally as they possibly could. This happened in uh, the American Language and Culture Program, the ALC program in 1995. This is our largest program, which typically now brings about 140 young people from Asia to California every year. Well, in 1995, we had one program of about 70 people and at some point in early August, they noted that the press was covering the fact that uh, World War II had ended 50 years earlier. And so several of them came to us and said, we should have an evening program about this. Well, we at VIA, we were very, very pleased that these students were coming up with their own idea as to a program, but we also knew this was a very sensitive topic. We had Japanese, and we had Taiwanese, and some of the Taiwanese had parents or grandparents who were in mainland China during World War II. Well, we said yes, and they said, let's have a planning meeting. We had that planning meeting, and it was kind of disappointing because uh, 
the main thing they decided was to split into two planning groups, a Japanese group and a Taiwanese group, not what we had had in, in mind. But in the following days, we saw these groups meeting, and they were very active and very large, the Japanese group particularly, quite, quite large. There obviously was a lot going on there. And finally, that night came. <clears throat> And as chance would have it, the Japanese group came first. And the first Japanese stood up and said, I would like to tell you what we were taught in our schools about World War II. And that turned out to be really interesting, very important for us to, to know. The second young man who came up changed the atmosphere of that room and that entire group for the rest of their time here by the first sentence that he said. He simply stood up and said, I want to tell you about the Nanking Massacre. And he went on in as dispassionate and fair and full a way as he possibly could to tell all of us what had happened in Nanking in 1937. There was not a dry eye in that room. and Many people were openly crying. But that group from that time on was just so much closer. They had found a way to share something that was very important to all of them in a way that they had never found a way to share before. And that to me still um, is an indication to me of what at a special time and in a special place you can do when you bring people together. Seeing all of you here today and hearing your personal stories, your testimonies, I'm of the opinion that, uh, that VIA is worth another 50 years. Thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you.